Hello, my name is Kasper König. I thank you very much uh, to have been invited to the conference The Relationship Beyond Images in Milan on November 9th. Unfortunately, I cannot come. I have a new hip and the doctor doesn't allow me to travel that early. So I just wanted to say that my relationship to art in public space became quite significant relatively early when a friend of mine, a curator in Münster, Klaus Busmann, invited me in 1977 to an exhibition of sculpture in public space and there was a particular reason for that. There was a controversy where a sculpture of Henry Moore was supposed to be given or in a very general way left to the University of Münster and the head of the university in a very unfriendly way said absolutely no. So I believe that this no was due to the fact to say we are independent, we don't sort of follow a zeitgeist and indirectly referring to their involvement during the Nazi time, which they presented as if it, it was just, by the way, it was not essential. No, it was really part of the power system during fascism. So Klaus Busmann, an art historian working at the museum, was very intelligent by saying, we have to give information about the history of modern sculpture from Bourdon to or whatever, Manzoni, and made an exhibition in the museum and invited me to do a contemporary part. I was living in New York at the time. The exhibition was for free and artists were commissioned, we invited a number of artists, were commissioned to f choose their own site and make a proposal on what they wanted to do. So it was not just representing them as artists, but something they wanted to do. And we would share the risk with whatever they wanted to do and made sure that it happened. And so the guidelines were very open, very undogmatic, and only by invitation. But then Every 10 years we invited different people. I've been involved since then. Different teams, um, in 77 they're all men, and 10 years later that was not the case, but then in 77, sculpture was very male-dominated, like architecture. So we learned on the job, and the fact that it didn't happen other than 10 years in between, there was nothing on that subject, that was very important because you could tell that things changed, you're part of a change and you don't notice it yourself. So in 77 there was an incredible aggression towards the exhibition, even though the exhibition was very discreet. It was not like saying, hey, come on, you have to look at it, this is great. No, 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 no. And that was even the 20s, the second time around too. So the last year, in 17, there were 650,000 visitors and everybody seemed to like it and we didn't know why they liked it so much. So we questioned, maybe we made a lot of mistakes, but that's the way things are. So even though I can't really be present, I just wanted to make this introduction and use a presentation which I made for an invitation also on, a, on that subject in Seoul, in, uh, in Korea, which more or less is asking the same questions, but in a very different context. 
Now I would like to introduce my presentation from Milan and since the conference is at the Trianale building, this restored work of Di Chirico, the fountain of the Misterioso, has been refurbished or renovated a couple of years ago and I remember coming across it many many years ago when it was a ruin. There was no uh, fence, it was just you kind of, as a ruin it was interesting but the f color had disappeared, some of it was sort of destroyed and, and I came there with my colleagues from Münster to show how this sort of happened. It was a time of pop and the Akiriko was asked to make a contribution and then this was taken from his paintings and I was very impressed because it was so public and very enjoyable for children and so on. And recently I was invited in Como um, at a kind of um, extended month of, of with younger artists and we went there. So I talked about the Kiriko at length and um, Emil, Emil, uh, and, and Petri, you know, the, the uh, film director. Another thing which I was thinking of that I went as a student to Denmark to see the work of Piero Manzoni, Socle du Monde, and it was just in a field, very raw, very kind of punk-like, it could have been a joke, maybe a, a one-liner, or it was a kind of universal experience. For me it was a universal experience because it was just a, a soccer, and it said Socle du Monde, but it was upside down, so you could understand that on that soccer the whole world was presented. And then again, same work, I remember, was presented at a documenta and they, the, the people who installed it, the company who installed it, put it wrong, in a wrong way so that the name Socle du Monde was not upside down but it was readable because that nobody told them. And it was used as a, as a uh, container for garbage. And by the time they found out that it was the wrong side away, they could not change it anymore because there were other sculptures around. So that I thought was really wonderful. Now I would like very much to thank the, um, the organizers of the talk and I hope very soon I will visit in order to see the, the Kiriko show which is on right now in Milan and I particularly like to thank Cecilia Guida and all her uh, other uh, people who invited me to the conference. Okay and after the conference I'm very happy to be online for questions and answers and it can go on as long as you want. So I will follow uh, the the conference and then I get a sense of what questions you have and if I might be able to give answers there will be probably more further questions rather than answers. Thank you. So the the working method each time was very significant so it's a process and each time means 100 days, 3 months. Uh, the city space is transformed by new contributions developed by artists free of charge and accessible for everybody. So I mean the old trick, for instance today you don't see any more telephone booths. But a telephone booth had a really a meaning if there was an accident you had to make a public call and help would arise. So today you have a mobile phone. Right? So even a kind of um, a postal box becomes kind of nostalgic because people don't, you know, like I happen to to continue 
using postcards, right? And the communication, because it is so unusual to use picture postcards as communication. Usually you send a note, you know, to your grandmother, wish you would be here, we have a wonderful time and so on. Basically saying, thank God you are not here. So, um, that is what made this exhibition so interesting because you could find out how change comes about. Um, so when we invited artists, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, depending on the team and what your preferences were and which works remained, which should actually go, but we always said, don't do something forever. Don't do something as a proposal. So after the visits, and today people come for three or four days, even young artists. 50 years ago they would come for at least four weeks or three weeks because it was too expensive to f pay a flight ticket from California to Europe. So it was easy, they stay three or four weeks and do other things in between. So also now there's a book coming out as an archive, 50 years. And there is so much material from the 77 and 87 letters, plans, drawings. Today everything is online. People come for two days and they know quite often beforehand what they want to do. So all that changes things a lot. Therefore we don't have a subject. So we didn't say we want to have a focus on ecology or focus on post-colonialism or post on this. Inadvertently, there is a focus five years or six years later. It's quite interesting when you look back that it has some kind of a momentum which you can interpret in a positive or in a critical way. So you never know where things are going to end up. So with site-specific works, that was in 77, 87, they sort of inscribed themselves into multiple spaces of the city. So the ideal change of view is enables the visitor and the residents, people who live there, who work there, who pass by, sometimes they don't even recognize it, then they recognize it from the media on television or because there's a controversy then they experience their own city in a different way. So, for instance, I remember in 97, we had a little guide catalog, which was canary yellow. And people were wondering, where are all these people walking around with this little canary yellow booklet, which you put into the to pocket and ride a bicycle. So the idea is that very few works should remain so it doesn't become a public museum in the city and to be as independent as possible. And when it remains, then it's a very democratic process of people who say they want it to stay or they don't want it to stay. And if they don't want it to stay, we would slow the process. For instance, the Bruce Nauman was not happening for 30 years and then it did happen, but it was the same site and the same proposal and interestingly enough, the same amount of money which he wanted, even though by that time, 30 years later, he was a very successful artist with a high price. So it's independent of the art market. And the change for instance, the, the, the most uh, popular work in 77 were the pool balls of Klaus Oldenburg. And then after a while, the city bought it. It was quite expensive to produce. Klaus Oldenburg, about 12, 15 years later, with our help, said, you know, it's not my sculpture anymore. It's the tourist logo. The city of Münster makes advertisement with the city of sculpture, the city of the pool balls. And then I said, okay, then you just propose to the city that you disown it as a work of art and you rent it to them as a public relations kind of entity 
and but that was too complicated for him and then because he would have had to pay money back so this is sort of interesting it's both and now it's a sculpture again because 50 years later it's sort of ingrained itself into this particular history which is very connected to a city which was totally destroyed during the war rebuilt and very is very readable but it's also a kind of a disneyland so after 50 or 60 or 70 years, you have a patina within the buildings, even though they are reconstructed buildings. So the autonomy as an idea is very crucial. However, it is very different. If it leaves a museum and insists on being public, at the same time under the same criteria as if it would be in a museum. So... The, my relationship to the topic of art in public spaces is very ambivalent these days. Um, so I've become quite critical of this global phenomenon and I think it can only be interesting if, if it's the exception and not the rule. Because the rule is that the commission then a lot of compromises have to be made. Many people are being asked if it is feasible. Uh, so if the artist, if he or she doesn't consider it in the beginning, usually it is up to many uninteresting misunderstandings. When it is interesting in terms of misunderstandings, then it's worthwhile. So the most probably intelligent work in this field was by Josef Beuys for Documenta, where he planted 7,000 trees, and not according to city planning, which is ruled by traffic, but rather where he felt there should be trees, and then a stone was next to it, and it created a lot of complications for city planning, which now is very, very productive, because the city was completely destroyed, during the war, there was a lot of military uh, at the time, and this helps the city to understand itself in a long breath. Um, so you, you cannot generalize this. Münster, the best thing about it is every 10 years, we don't even know if it will happen again. So we reintroduce another city from the industrial uh, area, which was very wealthy because of steel and coal and so on, in the 60s and 70s and has now pff, more or less disappeared but it still has a kind of utopian architecture and also public sculpture which is interesting but then the city of Münster is not interested in that but this it's not the city who initiated the exhibition but uh, an entity of the province through the museum so there's also a kind of constant fight that the city thinks, yeah, it's their thing because there are so many tourists coming. However, I feel very committed to a kind of decentralization and more a kind of subversive program and not to take art too important, but to utilize the, the complexity of artists proposing something which is meaningful but would never be proposed by, let's say, people who are primarily politically involved. So the Hans-Peter Feldmann, he proposed to restore and make a public toilet into a perfect place, which is not a work of art, but it's very useful. People will appreciate it. There are people who work there. They feel it's, it's a good place to work. It makes sense. They will make money. There's friendly atmosphere. So that is basically where it becomes interesting. And again, only a year ago, I saw the uh, Alberto Buri in Palermo, where there was an earthquake and the whole village, which was destroyed, was basically made as a kind of memory, as a death cloth over those who lost their homes. And it's a fantastic monument. It's very abstract, but it also honors the people who had to leave. So, basically, um, 
here the Kiriko, which is nice, <laughs> and uh, and Manzoni, also from Milan, uh, is coming to my mind, and I wish, I wish very much, I could have uh, met Piero Gilardi, whose park in Turin is fantastic, dealing with ecology, and that is basically a kind of a venue which I think Münster in six, seven years could pick up on. So I hope to meet um, uh, Piero Gilardi the next time I'm in Italy. Okay. For instance, this work, which existed, but then was presented by the artist of Keith Herring, relates to a local story, which would be too far to tell, about a Catholic priest who was thrown out of the church because he uh, adhered to, um, to, to, to modern science and therefore was no good since he was wondering about the dogma of the church. And this is the red dog for Professor Landua. So this is an anecdote which only makes sense if you are familiar with the history of this particular area. Now, for instance, on one hand, you had a work of Richard Long, an artist who walked in the landscapes, he was in the Himalaya, he was in all continents, and he would describe his walk through photos or through drawings as his actual work of art. And when he had this circle, full circle of stones from a nearby quarry, he said, I don't want them to stay after the exhibition. They should just go back to the quarry and then the stones could be used for whatever building, streets or so. Now, a significant work, which was made by Bruce Nauman when he invited in, in the first edition, was at a university, at a campus for natural science, but it was delayed 30 years before it could be done and it was done and it's called a square depression. It is basically 25 by 25 meters and it goes inverted. It's a pyramid, a very low pyramid, inverted. And it was finally done and it's very anonymous kind of a building for physics and uh, chemistry building and so on. And it's interesting because you stand on the outside and look in. The people are inside this inverted pyramid are being looked at. So it basically focuses the process of looking and being looked at. And it is called square depression. I mean, that's a physical description of what happens, but there's also a very strong psychological component. Mm. Each time the question is being asked, what is public and what is private? And also, what is art and what is not art? So the question of aesthetics is very essential. And then 10 years, this keeps on going on a theoretical level, but not on a physical level. Work of, of uh, Aisha Ergman mm -hmm. came about because she proposed something for the cathedral. Mm -hmm. Then the Catholic Church denounced her proposal very, very, on a very high theoretical level with uh, kind of theological arguments that it had not, that there was no um, uh, relationship to the, to, the, to the church itself. And then she finally decided to take statues from the cathedral, which have been taken away in a depot and made new. So the, 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 uh, chem, the, the, um, they would, de the decay from the car and so on, and so on, would, could be stopped. She took the originals over the cathedral in a helicopter. 
and the helicopter and the statue was an idea on a Fellini film. Mm -hmm. So she incorporated an existing story and 10 years later made a work where you could walk over the water. So the next logical thing that if she would do something and if the exhibition should happen again, it probably would be something with fire, right? Ah, yeah. Now, Nam John Pike and Klaus Busmann had a very, very good relationship to Nam John Pike. He invited him for the Biennale, the German pavilion, shortly after East and West Germany came together. So then the government agency said, we would like you to consider East and West. And he said, yes, yes, I already made my choice. I asked Nam John Peck from New York, and he's teaching in Dusseldorf, and I asked Hans Hake, who is from Germany but lives in New York since 30 years, to represent the German pavilion. So he had a Korean artist from New York and a German artist in New York. And that was very, very smart because he said there are both of them great artists, but art is not necessarily national, but it is very connected to food, to dialect, to things which are very particular, local, but then at the same time <coughs> universal. Pike proposed a work in a moat, in a water ring around the castle. There was a platform and around there there were ducks. Ducks, also very small ducks. And he put an empty television set on this platform mm -hmm. and he made a Buddha mm -hmm. himself. But it looked like Giacometti makes a Buddha. So you see the Buddha looking at an empty television and the television at him. And it is called Buddha for Ducks because you hear quack, 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 quack. So this was a Fluxus piece, very mm -hmm. philosophical. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, he made this mm -hmm. grand piece mm -hmm. in front of the chateau. Mm -hmm. These were American cars from the 20s and 30s because his father was a millionaire in Korea, collected cars. He liked these big American cars. And he had these, it was uh, sponsored by Samsung, and he had these cars bought together in America and shipped to Münster. They were stripped, silver painted, and then the Requiem of Mozart was playing very loud, and inside the cars there was junk of computers. Mm -hmm. So it was an apotheosis to the modern world of communication. And you could see one artist here doing something really big and popular, and there very, very chamber music-like, very fine and so on. So this is an example which is extraordinary because Lothar Baumgarten proposed a work on a roof of a church which was rebuilt after the war and he wanted to have the roof itself in a different optical constellation. And he put three lamps, electric lamps, inside the cage so that at three, four in the morning, when people would go home having drunk and so on, you are not sure, have you had too much to, too much to drink or what's going on there? So it was for the lost souls. That is interesting. Quite often artists would not do what you would expect them. It's not like making a kind of a, a recognizable product, you see. But 
doing something inspired by the circumstances. Even though when circumstances were very, very difficult, they suddenly came up with something which is magic, which you can only see when you know it, and be very, very surprised. One could make an ex exception and do it. And this is fantastic. You see, so the process is quite of more important than the result. And there is a quote by Robert Filiou, with whom I made a book, Teaching and Learning as Performing Arts. And in, in an interview, he said to me, more or way, more way less, by the way, art is much too important to take it too important. So that, in a way, is kind of a motto, right? And I don't believe in public commissions which are made to stay forever and then have a big group of people to decide it and then you have to make compromises and so on and so on. So I think it's good that you are kind of the ambassador for this um, presentation in regard to Münster as an artist because it's a very high responsibility when you do something and you are asked for lots of compromises and eventually you might even win this competition. You spend the money and then you don't even want to go there. You don't want to be reminded. It becomes kind of a burden, right? So that is sort of the message which I have. You see, this, for instance, this photo of a work by Katharina Fritsch. This, it's a very Catholic town, and this Madonna of Lourdes is pretty much in every school and in every hospital and so on in the countryside. And what she did, she made it stark yellow, right? And she placed it between a church, a department store, and a special store where you can buy goods for Catholic priests and for the mm. church and so on. Souvenirs. Candles. Mm and put it in, in the center. And there were a lot of protests. People either said religion is free. This is not sanctuary by the state, right? So some people were against the fact that it was so Catholic. And then she was vandalized in Madonna. And um, it was immediately rebuilt immediately fixed again. And this is a photo from Domos, an Italian architecture design magazine. And today everybody would read this, aha, uh -huh, this is a Muslima and this is a Catholic, right? But at the time there was no focus on, on Islam or Muslims, right? Mm. Through sort of immigration. So also the, 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 the way you look at things can quite change according to the economic and political circumstances. But this, this is something which you can still see in France, in Paris, where you have pissoirs, right, for man. And he had this, there the fountain, and here's a sculpture of Franz West, and you see it, it's the Pont Vue, and you can go there and piss, right? So that is exists probably a hundred years ago also in, in most European cities. I think now for touristic reasons they still keep it in Paris, right? But he again, he's a Viennese and he connects to a kind of uh, Freudian context of the fountain and um, um, I am Pink, artist from East Germany. He participated and said, okay, I take one of my sculptures in small maquette and put it on the table of the mayor and then the visitor of the exhibition can go and see him twice a day for three hours. So many people came to the office pretending to be interested in art, but they wanted to talk to him for whatever reason, mm -hmm. right? So he used art as a pretext to create communication between the representative of the city right, and their interest. And then they probably would also talk about power and politics and art indirectly. Now, this is hardcore. 
This is the land which slopes down to the lake. It's an artificial lake. And this is water level, right? So there are two huge rings, one inner and one outer ring. The inner ring is water level. The outer ring is according to the the topography. Mm. This, for instance, when it was done in 87, was ignored. People didn't even put graffiti on it because they thought it had maybe some meaning for technical reasons from the university or so, uh, for physical, you know, as if it was an instrument. Again, it's important to understand the city, the, the cathedral, and then in early the sort of middle ages the, the the inner city around the cathedral the cathedral there were the merchants and then this was the fortification which now is there's no traffic only bicycles this is the chateau which looks historical but it was a fortification but it was built in the late 17th century and this is a artificial lake where the balls of Oldenburg are. So the city is very, very readable. You see, you arrive here with the train station, and as soon you cross the inner city, you can read it, you can understand it. Okay, that became sort of the city logo. Um, now, Michael Asher, it's an amazing piece. It was not understood when it was made. It is not site-specific. It moves every week from the inner city out, and then within the period of 100 days of the exhibition, moves back. And the locations are marked, and there is a handfold, and you are told you can visit, even though what you do see is a caravan, that is not the work of art, but then it moves every week and you get an understanding sort of of the city. And since it was done four times, it changed in its complexity and understanding. So first it was totally ignored, then it was looked upon as being a kind of a too late conceptual art. Mm -hmm. And the fourth time around, it really made sense to the people because they understood how much the city had changed and you are part of a change which you do not feel. Mm -hmm. It's an organic process, right? You get used to certain things and so on. So that is probably, and it couldn't be done again because Michael Asher, who is the same age as I, died a couple of years ago. Otherwise, it probably would have been, you know, again and again and again. Um, but it's always the same caravan, which by now is already, you have to look for it. You know, he he doesn't want to, keep it at the work of art. It's not a work of art, it's just a vehicle in a double sense. Mm -hmm. Now, Bruce Norman, we talked about, it's extraordinary. That is probably the most significant work because it is so surprising, the scale, but the scale is very discreet. It is not, it creates space. It doesn't occupy space. It's, it's like negative architecture, but it's made for for a complex social interchange. Okay, now, Alexandra Pirici, she did a piece in the city hall where during the war they put it aside and it wasn't destroyed. And she's from Romania and she made a dance piece in this, the historical uh, place where the Westphalian piece was made and talks about internet and modern media and the question of national identity and global kind of um, uh, situation. And every day for about four, five hours, 30 people could go. It's like, an, like a play in a way and, and participate in this interesting exchange. This work, very controversial, it's the fountain of Nicole Eisenman. And these people are kind of 
could be male, female, more male, female in a sense. Two of them were made in bronze, and the other one it's called a sketch vowel fountain in um, in in plaster. And they were vandalized three times. There was a political, there was an election, and then people would really vandalize, and we would fix them again and vandalize it. And now the this fountain should be done permanently, but with the vandalization being part of the story. Aisha Erkman, she's the artist I told earlier about the working with the cathedral and that was impossible and then she had this idea of bringing the statues from a depot over the cathedral by helicopter onto the roof of the museum and this time she made people walk over the water and you know there is underneath you can't see it a, a kind of a structure and you walk over it and um, and it's like a, a notion, you know, like Jesus walking over the water. Now, Koki, Koki Tanaka, Koki Tanaka, he really spent, I don't know, two and a half months in Münster. He particularly addressed his work to people who lived in Münster were non-German and who were going to that place partly because to learn German and also to socialize and it became an interesting uh, multicultural kind of aspect as part of the exhibition. So some people were very interested in this and only then had some other interest in what else the exhibition was about. So that was a subtle way of cross-reference and uh, different values. Um, and some people really, that was one of the most popular uh, projects because it had more to do with really the question, how do we live together? To have a context in finding out who the other person was. But it was really good. Michael Smith is a very melancholic person and an extraordinary artist. He proposed a tattoo parlor and 20, uh, many artists were invited, also all those who have ever had participated in Münster, to make designs, <coughs> but many others as well. And that people who are older than 65 could get tattoos for only half of their money. This is an example that suddenly there was um, a tradition sculpture in the exhibition where before it was not so much about you know the human body but much more a human body as a quote as a quotation rather than the actual you know historical uh, essence for sculpture Stefan Balkenor mm. it's made out of wood and it's the wall doesn't exist anymore, they the house, and it was relatively high up so that some people actually felt there was a man committing suicide. <laughs> now they would call the fire police. Now Daniel Buren, he made four of those very stylized gates to the, from, the, from, the, from the church or from the cathedral to the inner city. And only one of them remained, the others were not. And he did a beautiful piece where he made flags which Münster presents during Carnival for a few days, but not in three colors, but reduced to two colors, red and white. And it creates a fantastic interior space. So it's where folklore and a kind of reductionist, minimalist aesthetic come together. Here, yeah, Buren. Mm. Fantastic. So it's similar like Karl Andre. He used the same method, mm. but he, he just flagged it for 100 days, where in Münster they only do it on one day at Carnival. So the, this is significant. The, the exhibition is always free. You don't have to pay money. 
and it is outdoors, even though when parts of it are sometimes within the museum because, but then it's open till 10 in the evening and the city transforms. It's, uh, um, it's popular, but it's never kind of condescending. It's not trying to sell hard. It's more, you know, people look around and, and, and there were times when the exhibition became more eventful or more kind of uh, uh, making it smaller or making it bigger. So it always breezes. And sometimes it's this way and sometimes that way. There's also a risk involved and that's important. So I hope it will never really become an institution which makes takes itself too important. We have to take care. That's very important. And that's my message to 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 anybody who is interested in art. You know, you have to take care of it and don't make it into an institution. Ask questions, don't give answers. So this is interesting. In my bathroom, I have souvenirs. And since I communicate mostly on postcards, which is very old fashioned, you only receive a postcard when your grandmother, you send it, wish you would be here, you are in the holidays and so on and so on. So it's a very old fashioned medium. But for me, it's very practical because you can say things very short, brief, you are polite, say no, thank you, thank you. So, uh -huh. And this happens to be a kind of souvenir from Minnesota. This is a theater which was built right after the war. And it is the most beautiful, really true modern building of young architects who opposed the reconstruction of a neoclassicist theater. And then the city said, okay, you make a proposal, and it was cheaper than the neoclassicist building, and they finally won it. Four architects, they all had been in the war, they studied after the war, and they were hungry and made a beautiful building. The best architecture ever after the war in Münster, but since then it is nearly as good as this. So, one of the architects also was friends with Klaus Wussmann, who was the inventor of Skulptur Projekte, and said, wouldn't it be interesting to do a sculpture exhibition in Münster? The city is kaput. We can somehow simulate a spirit of something new. So this is sort of a souvenir. That's a work of Dan Graham, who was a very personal friend, my best friend in the art world in New York. And for instance, he suggested to invite um, Michael Asher instead himself in 77, because he said, no, that's a different kind of idea about sculpture, since he's from California and so on. This is a wonderful work, also from Münster, of George Brecht. And he put the word void on a stone, which was found there. It's probably, I don't know, a million years old, and it's part of, of um, a geological formation. So he put void on it. Then he sold it to the city of Münster as a sculpture, and he said, if you want to change it and you don't like the word anymore, just turn it over and it remains where it is. So this is a very typical kind of fluxus attitude. It's found, it's a kind of chance, it is very beautiful as a rock, it has a mystery, it has an old story to tell, and then he said void, the English name, and I mentioned already that it was impossible to translate it. It would have been too metaphysical, die Leere, the emptiness, or too casual. Now, this was a Baroque architect who was responsible for the most significant buildings in Münster. And as you can see, he was a typical, he was a student in Rome, then he came back, he was inspired by, by 
Baroque architecture, but he was very local. He was a peasant, and you can see from his nose, he liked to drink schnapps, right? Okay, this is a palais which was survived the war, and Richard Serra made a sculpture as an homage to this wonderful architect. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, cartoon making a reference to the changes of sculpture, the expansion, the, the, the pool balls of Klaus Oldenburg, and a joke saying, no, this is not a molesting, this is maybe a performative act of art, contemporary art. So making fun of yourself is always healthy and interesting. <laughs>